February 20th, 1962, dawn at Cape Canaveral, dawn of Colonel John Glenn's day of destiny. Everything is in readiness on pad 14. Supported by the gantry, the Mercury capsule rests atop the Atlas missile as the countdown in the blockhouse proceeds. These men are but part of the team of 15,000 men back of the astronauts' flight, a team that will follow Glenn's every moment. It's five hours before blastoff as he squeezes into his spacesuit. His wide grin belies the 10 postponements of his flight that have kept him grounded. Finishing touches are made on the 40-year old man spacesuit. And there's an air of optimism, a feeling that this truly is the day. Carrying his now familiar portable air conditioner, he prepares to go to the 11th deck of the gantry. The clocks point to 6 a.m. The skies are beginning to lighten and a cool north wind rustles across the cape. Colonel Glenn's date with destiny comes 10 months after the Russians claimed an orbital flight by Yuri Gagarin and less than a year after Alan Shepard blazed a suborbital trail for the U.S. This is the climax of three years of training. This is the moment that the eyes of the world turn to Cape Canaveral. The Russian orbits were in a thick fog of secrecy. Every step the United States makes is in the white-hot glare of worldwide publicity. In the capsule atop the Atlas missile, the colonel will be strapped to a contoured couch. Once in flight, the mercury will be tilted so that the astronaut will ride backwards. The seconds tick off his rendezvous with destiny. Millions are moved to silent prayer. Everything is go. The takeoff of the Atlas, blasted aloft by 360,000 pounds of thrust, is perfect. Glenn is subject to six times the force of gravity in Friendship 7, but he reports back calmly to Commander Alan Shepard below. Fuel 102, 101, oxygen 78, 100, amps 27. Roger, loud and clear, flight path is good, 6-9. Roger, checks okay. Mine was 7-0 on your mark. There's some vibration area coming up here now. Roger, reading a loud and clear, John. Oh, Roger, we confirm on TM. Edison Tower is green. Roger. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turnaround has started. Capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Uh, Roger, seven, you have a go, at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. This is Friendship 7. I can see clear back a big cloud pattern way back across toward the Cape. Beautiful sight. That is affirmative. That's what's set in the clock. Uh, the horizon is a brilliant, a brilliant blue. He speeds at 17,500 miles an hour as he reaches a high point of 160 miles and a low altitude of 99 miles. Each orbit on the 81,000-mile trip takes about 90 minutes. Three times the colonel sees a sunrise, and when he enters the atmosphere once more, a shield protects the astronaut from the 3,000-degree heat. The command ship in the target area, the Randolph, follows the course of Colonel Glenn's descent and alerts other pickup vessels as the Mercury speeds to a landing. The Drogue chute opens to correct any spin, and then a larger chute pulls out to ease the Friendship 7 to the sea. Four hours and 56 minutes after takeoff, Colonel Glenn returns to Earth. Right at hand is the destroyer Noah, and she speeds to the capsule to take the vehicle and pilot aboard. 
the flight is a success beyond the wildest dreams of the scientists and technicians involved. The end of a saga. With support cables attached, a pincer-like crane lifts the Friendship 7 aboard. The triumph of the U.S. space team. The climax of three years of work and planning. the Friendship 7 is eased aboard the destroyer with Glenn still inside, the crew attempts to open the upper exit, but then blow the escape hatch so that he may leave the capsule immediately. The Marine landed. Situation go. Colonel John H. Glenn Jr. left his footprints among the stars. He has a grin that is as wide as the path he blazed as he rests briefly before being transferred to the carrier. He's lifted aboard in a maneuver that looks more dangerous than the flight itself. The helicopter takes him to the carrier for a debriefing and examinations by medical men before he takes two days rest on an island in the Bahamas. The helicopter no sooner touches down on deck than Glenn gets a preview of the congratulations that are still to come. On every hand, there is jubilation. On every side, smiles and cheers. He signs over his precious log to the National Space Administration. Data that holds secrets of outer space. Now, a rest before the deluge. The deluge of honors a proud country waits to bestow. The return of a conquering hero. Home is the man of the hour, and into the arms of his waiting wife for a warm moment before he is claimed by cheering thousands. First honors for Colonel Glenn. The President presents the Distinguished Service Medal of the Space Administration to the nation's space pioneer. Then on to Washington, where a steady drizzle can't put a damper on the reception for the nation's new star from outer space. He rides from the White House to the Capitol as more than a quarter of a million hail the man and his achievement. Both the galleries and the floor are jammed to capacity as the Colonel arrives to a standing ovation. With a modesty that befits a man of awesome deeds, he has this to say. We are all proud to have been privileged to be part of this effort, to represent our country as we have. As our knowledge of this universe in which we live increases, may God grant us the wisdom and guidance to use it wisely. Thank you. Colonel John Glenn, Jr., the first American in orbit.